Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I want to start by saying that I'm deeply grateful to Karen Wilkin, one of the wonderful professors here at the New York Studio School. Um, and I wanted to say a couple of things that were funny about meeting Karen and how long we go back as friends. Um, I first met Karen in 2004. She was visiting critic at my graduate school in Savannah, Georgia. And during her visit, I went to her lecture, and it was completely um, flooring to the artist um, and everyone in the room. We were all just, um, our minds were explo exploding by her um, insight into painting and the artist that she showed us. And <clears throat> the next day, Karen visited my studio. And um, our visit might have lasted five minutes. However, it was the most monumental studio visit I had during my entire graduate career. She walked around the studio and looked my paintings up and down. And I was terrified of what she was going to say. And she said, <laughs> um, you're doing all of the hard stuff. You just are using too small of a brush. <laughs> And with this insight, she gave me the courage to trust the integrity of my mark making, even if it resided in a single gesture. Um, Karen and I reconnected in 2009 when I moved to New York. My first year in New York was quite a struggle. I worked as a substitute teacher and lived in my studio without a shower. <laughs> and unbeknownst to me, Karen Wilkin had learned I moved to town. Fortunately, she remembered our studio visit and in Savannah many years before, and she recommended me for the Triangle Art Residency. This residency awarded me a free studio for a year, and aside from its great importance in helping me get my feet on the ground in New York, it also gave me the space to explore and develop my practice. Now many years later, I'm so pleased to be here tonight through Karen's recommendation, speaking at a school whose foundation is built upon giving artists the same opportunity. Thank you. So I always start with this image. Um, it was the first image that really brought me into um, this whole idea of being an artist, mainly because I just was so entranced with the idea that art could be magic or that there was some magical component to it. Um, I was six years old, and there was an animator who came to visit my school, and he sat at the table and had a white notebook and a pencil and drew for us this bunny rabbit that danced across the white page. And I remember being completely floored by his ability to create some type of space and movement with these simple tools. And I recall like literally elbowing the other kids to get out of the way so that I could get as close to him as I possibly could um, because I had to know how he was able to do that. And from that point on, I recall really like realizing every time I would see something that was a convex or a concave lie, line. I, I didn't really understand the word convex or concave when I was little, but I remember trying to um, decipher the way lines were put together to create um, space and form. <clears throat> and when I was growing up, I um, was in Oklahoma, and so I had very limited resources to uh, art history or any kind of Western um, art historical kind of books. And so a lot of the things I looked at were things like this, where you have like a Native American or one of these Navajo blankets. And <clears throat> a lot of the ways I taught myself how to draw and paint were just through using like uh, repetition and trying to draw the patterns um, similar to what you see here. And I feel like it contributed a lot to the way that I work with patterns and the colors that I use and the way I kind of map out space obviously has a lot to do with these Navajo blankets. And um, the other peculiar thing I think is that most of the reference images I used when I was painting figures were Native American, so um, I didn't have a typical um, Western person I was looking at. A lot of the um, Indians were Native American, or these images were Native American, so I drew a lot of minorities growing up, and I didn't realize that that was strange until I left home. 
Um, these were also things that you see in Oklahoma a lot, like at the dentist office or um, at the bank. <laughs> uh, this type of imagery is just everywhere, and um, I grew up being surrounded by it, and I never thought that it was really that uncommon until, again, I left home and realized that not everybody has these confrontive type of uh, very uh, war-oriented imagery surrounding them. Uh, but what I really drew from these types of images were the surface qualities that's found within them, like you can see here the suede looks like suede, the leather really looks like leather. You can kind of like um, see all of the individual beads on his coat there and the skin is rendered exactly like skin. So I feel like as artists, a lot of these um, painters were really interested in surface qualities and trying to diversify the way that they explained um, surface. And so it makes a lot of sense for me to be drawn to this painting, which is um, what I've been working with for several years now. I've been thinking about this painting a lot, and it's been the main point of departure for where my work is now. And my first interest in the work was actually the white wall behind the Milk Maid in this painting, um, mainly because I am so fascinated by things that are not like my own paintings. and. I use a lot of color and I tend to maximize the surfaces that I'm using and a lot of texture and goopy um, material. And so this wall is exactly the opposite of what the nature of my work sort of stands for. But I'm interested in it mainly because it's comprised of several different colors all webbed together, yet it conveys a white wall. And I find that optically to be such an interesting um, occurrence. And so I started thinking about that white wall really early on in my 20s, but then it kept sort of showing up when I would go investigate different reference images. And so I decided to start considering the white wall a lot more and actually like how the white wall in general serves a role in art and how it holds a painting on the wall or serves as a space for a sculpture. <clears throat> so I started investigating this painting and thinking about like what may have happened behind the wall and asked questions about the milkmaid like um, what's inside of her pocket, what's under the table, what's behind her wall, what's happening outside of the window, and tried to bring a new conversation and this parafictional world to the table of this milkmaid. <clears throat> the first major project I worked on for it, um, I basically had access to an entire gallery space that allowed me to make her mudroom or her broom closet. So I began to build the domestic space of the milkmaid as a painting in three dimensions. And I took in like every aspect of the space of the gallery as if it were the inside of a white canvas. So I had every single square inch of the gallery memorized. I had it all measured down to every square inch. And <clears throat> I decided to take away the stretcher, take away the canvas, and just use the white of the wall as a surface to work with. And I began to take the paint off the canvas entirely and use it as a sculptural form. So I started looking at these medieval tiles and 17th century components that I could reinvent with today's technology and understanding of visualizations. So I replicated a lot of these medieval tiles, and then I started making casts of um, paint tiles. That was how this project started. So this was my first uh, rendition of cast paint tiles, and I was like a mad scientist in my studio. And I wanted these tiles to kind of have the effect of maybe a jelly shoe that you would see at Walmart, and something like deeply historical mixed together, because I feel like, in general, we're bombarded with those two connotations at every given moment, like 
Um, depending on where you are in the country, you could be um, met with something very deeply historical and then something that's um, very cheap and easy to get. Um, during this project, I, I built an inventory of the Milk Maid's things, and I started really considering her as a person and giving her another identity and thinking about what the identity of a milkmaid could be today. And so I started building a library of her things like tapestries and hair brushes and socks and shoes and basically anything that you can think of that would be a part of daily life. I started reinventing for her using the image sources that I found through my research. And I became captivated at that time with uh, artifacts. And I essentially really stopped looking at art history altogether or contemporary art for a while because I was so interested in thinking about um, what a spoon that was 3,000 years old could really identify with today. That <clears throat> you could have a spoon that looks like this that was 3,000 years old and you could see something similar to it at Pier 1 Imports and then you could see another version of it at the Met. And I just find that kind of stratosphere incredibly intriguing. So these are some of the shoes I was referencing that I feel like are very contemporary. Like they look like they could be made today. And I was floored by the idea of like finding these historical components that we're actually speaking to today. <clears throat> so these are the other um, types of references I was investigating. Um, and I like the unusual nature of like going in and finding like these old jewelry pieces and recreating them with today's languages. I just felt like it was fascinating to go into every component of daily life and remake it as a piece of art because they're usually painted, but then I was making all of these things that are usually painted in a still life out of paint. <clears throat> Here's some of the molds that I created, and I like labeled all of them. <laughs> it got really obsessive for a while, and I have basically everything you can possibly think of that you would have in your daily life. Um, I have a mold of that, and it's like the milkmaid's daily item. <clears throat> Here's one of the pictures. Um, I think I kind of lost my mind during that year, actually, because <laughs> um, I, I felt like I had so much going on, and I had maybe 35 uh, interns working on this project. It was like an enormous endeavor, and every step I took um, forward, it felt like there was so much more to do. It was like so weird to be painting in three dimensions, and there were so many things that I'd, I'd never really thought of before, and I broke... Um, the elastic of my mind in a way that was holding things together in a two-dimensional plane. And I broke it all apart and started looking at it from all of these different perceptions because what I was doing was looking at paint itself as a different way of seeing it. And I was trying to shift the perception of what it is on its own. So it was a really uh, crazy time for me because I was I couldn't be at my studio enough. Like I was there until three in the morning every night, and I, w I felt like I was giving birth to something bigger than what I could serve, which is ironic because she was a servant, and I felt all of a sudden like I was serving this project, and I like couldn't get enough done for it. So <clears throat> it was magical and insane all at the same time. So. With the interns, I was working with several different architecture students. I had an anthropology student at one time, um, Fiverr students. Like I had a person basically from every walk of life and major was attracting themselves to this project, which I also felt like happened naturally. And we started basically building the gallery out of cardboard in my studio. <laughs> So you can see here, like the windows uh, mapped out and the door um, and made in cardboard. And this was an image of my studio at the time. And all of these tiles I rearranged like 3,000 times, um, like because I was actually physically painting with them. So the whole 
act of making this work was incredibly uh, physical, and I had to use all of my body and climb up big stairs to get to the top of the piece. And I was rearranging it constantly, trying to map out how it would feel to walk through this three-dimensional painting. <clears throat> Another strange happening that occurred during this time was often when I would look up at the interns and they would be sitting in front of the window in my studio, it was almost like they were turning themselves into Vermeer paintings. So this performance aspect to the work began to occur and you can see here kind of what I'm talking about, like each of these women are sitting close to the window and oftentimes they would be sewing. And I just found that to be also incredibly interesting in terms of like these people were doing very um, antiquated types of projects, yet they had Adidas sweatpants on or they had some kind of signifier on them that made them look like they were from today. <clears throat> So you can see here in this image one of the relationships I was building. Uh, this was the moment in the studio right before it left for the show. And I can't really explain why in words, but it was one of the richest moments I had ever had with my work or in my studio because it was a, after a year of uh, working so hard on building and inventing all of these new avenues towards painting. And this was the installation in the gallery. Um, you can see, like, I took everything into consideration. Um, for instance, the pipelines, like the black pipelines that you see on the ceiling were all made in my studio. They were like sculptures. And the white pipeline in the back was actually a sculpture. And for me, they were like serving as lines, as if they were just like black or white paint strokes in a painting. <clears throat> It's hard to tell from the images, but it was definitely like an experience to walk around in the space because um, the compilation of all of these materials together and the colors and the textures, it really read as almost like a hologram or a space that you were walking into within a painting. Um, like all of the wallpaper was hand drawn. I think from the outside, it might have been hard to see the investment um, given to each uh, individual component, but it was uh, an extreme project. And this was uh, one of the images from the show where all of these things, or most of these things are made out of paint. So it was literally like these layers coming together, creating this dimensional world. And uh, one of my friends that's a writer actually came into the show and said something really beautiful. He said um, he felt like the work was poured into place. And there were just a lot of really beautiful things that um, were said and happened during that time that related to the milkmaid, which made me want to keep going with this idea because the idea of her pouring the milk and the idea that I was pouring this paint, this paint into molds and the thought that they were all poured together to create this image uh, really interested me. <clears throat> it was much like walking into a Bernard painting where the edges were, were really lost and you couldn't really tell where something began or ended. Here's like a snippet of one of the still lifes in the show. Um, so for instance, like that lemon is made out of paint and it took a really long time for the lemon to dry. And <laughs> I just thought that was interesting too, that like in a painting, you know, you wait for things to dry and there's all this time-based uh, instances that happen when you're making a work of art. And so it, it really threw everything that I had known about painting on its head. My next project was called Walk-In Pantry, and I, again, used an architectural space to create another world of the milkmaid. Um, this would be her pantry. And for this project, I was thinking about, like, uh, what would the milkmaid have painted with if she were around today? And I thought that she could have used the charcoal from the foot warmer. And so I used charcoal to create a lot of the paintings for this show. 
And for this project, I really kind of reinvented her status, um, thinking about the idea that she <clears throat> was this milkmaid, and usually when you walk into a pantry, it's a very small closet type of space, and now we're in this grand, um, glorious gallery with these beautiful columns, and so to create a pantry would kind of re-identify her status as if she had this enormous pantry that was within a palace. <clears throat> I looked at a lot of uh, Egyptian architectural drawings for this project um, because I was introducing like the idea of, for instance, the white space that you see in the doorways there. I thought that it was really interesting to work with the idea of the white wall serving as an entrance point, like you see here in these drawings. So I left like the sides of um, the walls there open, and they really were, in their own right, this sort of space that felt like you could walk into it. And I had never really worked with that type of optical illusion before that was as effective as it was. <clears throat> Um, I also worked with stained glass. Um, they were like, everything that I'm making is like a faux version of what it is. So it's not like I made stained glass. It's, it's more along the lines of the idea that we live in a material world and we can't get away from the material constructs that we're within. So I might as well make things as an artist that relate to this material world and just make faux versions of them. <clears throat> so I looked at a lot of Matisse and how he worked with stained glass and his idea of cutouts within stained glass. And this was like a paint version of stained glass. So this is the other side of the gallery when you're looking at the entrance um, with these little stained glass windows and we blocked out the rest of the window and just had these little, um, almost like peepholes um, in the stained glass that were like fruits and apples and oranges that related to the idea of um, a pantry. And it kind of like gave this really holy experience, like the idea of taking stained glass out of a church and putting it into a pantry is kind of absurd. So here's some of the paintings that were made. Um, I used charcoal and also enamel paint, and I was thinking about how the charcoal that would be used in a food warmer would be in service to others, and uh, the use of enamel paint could be used on your nails as if you're serving yourself. So I feel like in life it's um, important to try and do both of those things, and there's such a hard balance between doing that. And so um, I wanted the paintings to reflect that tension through the material. <clears throat> and I just had some uh, wacky subjects that, as you saw before, the wall was black, and this black charcoal kind of acted as this weird negative space where the paint was almost like cut out of the black negative space, similar to the tiles. <clears throat> I started to think about my entire um, process as an artist as like having a deck of cards. Like my practice is now this arrangement of different methodologies that I've um, brought to life or um, uh, birthed somehow. And now, depending on the show, I feel like I'll give way to whatever deck or whatever series of cards is necessary to work with the space or the idea that I'm trying to portray. So for this show, I wanted to make uh, the pantry paintings out of uh, works on canvas. And for the next show, it might be all stained glass or whatever. It doesn't necessarily matter to me anymore um, what the material is. It has more to do with the arrangement of the space, the architecture, and the idea that I'm trying to convey and what best serves that idea. Uh, after the, the show, we had a dinner at the gallery, which I was lucky enough to get to design myself. And I wanted the um, tables to look like uh, 17th century still lifes. And it was really fun to put this uh, dinner together because it was also this other weird component that was happening with the work that um, this other extension was allowed where I thought about making a dinner party and, and in a way it became like um, an installation. 
<clears throat> and we had planned to use uh, an adult harvest um, during the dinner um, to create like an ambiance um, in the pantry as a uh, sort of a social commentary and the the woman who was meant to play that night ended up backing out at the last minute and she said her daughter could play and <laughs> so she did and it was remarkable and it was an incredibly powerful experience because she was very um, uh, poised when she uh, played and everybody was incredibly moved by her work and it was her first performance and I felt like it was also my first performance where at this show I really um, announced myself as a servant to my work and for me it was kind of like uh, building a relationship to an Annunciation painting or something like that where I was announcing and for me it was important to announce to my community that I was going to be serving my work, that that was my role, that it really wasn't about anything more than what I could do as a servant for art. And so to extend that gesture, I did like a ceremonial pour of water um, during the dinner for everybody there. And there were some funny things that like were said also that night, like a woman wrote me the next day and said that she just poured water all day because she wanted to hear that noise again, that somehow the noise of uh, me pouring the water into the glass became something that she now like felt was something. So it was kind of interesting what that experience gave way to. <clears throat> and then my last, my most recent project that I've been working on has to do also with the Milk Maid and I was uh, given a show at this museum in Oklahoma called the Oklahoma Contemporary and they're kind of revamping their, um, their museum and they're going to be bringing in all of these new contemporary artists to the city and so they asked me to come and kind of initiate this new regime they're building there and uh, it was quite fun. So when I did the site visit, I was thinking about building her entire house in the space because it's like the hugest space you've ever seen. It's probably 9,000 square feet at least. And so I had op an opportunity and access to more space than I'd ever um, thought of before. And so I was going to build like several installations of domestic spaces. <clears throat> and when I got there and and visited, I realized that I wanted to build her storage compartments there instead. And so I started with this window as the first installation. And I thought about the idea of lace and how like in 17th century lace making was such a pivotal thing that people did or like such a primary thing that women would spend their days doing. <clears throat> and thought of her daily objects, these artifacts I've been mentioning. And I used this uh, stained glass window that's in Cologne. It's like a really obscure stained glass window that's located in Cologne. And I thought that it was really beautiful because it sort of replicates the idea of lace and it gathers together and shows these like swords or stars or things like that. And so I wanted to convey something similar with color and use this idea. And um, I got this idea for the lace pattern from a dollar store tablecloth that I used. This was actually um, made into a stencil that was used for the stained glass windows. And I like this thought of taking a vinyl, really cheap dollar store tablecloth and then turning it into this uh, royal material or royal looking material. <clears throat> and so this was, in progress, I was only able to look at four of the panels at a time, and there were 14 window panels. So it was kind of scary because I was working with this um, with this piece um, blindly in two different ways. And in one regard, like I had to paint those white uh, towers you see on the floor; those were exactly the size of the panels. And I would actually collage together the images for the panels on the floor so that I could see through them with the white. So again, it was like now taking the wall to the floor and using this white surface as, as a point of illumination. And then it was also like a, a blind way of working for me because I really didn't know how things were gonna look until I had them in the space. So here's me in relationship to them. 
And I had a great time cutting and pasting colored paper together. I had never really allowed myself to do that before, but I always loved like collaging and cutting and pasting things together and putting them in front of windows. <clears throat> And I would say the most like uh, commonality between all of the works has to do with this black that I've been using. And uh, I'm really using the black as like a chiseling tool. Like I'm thinking about black and white a lot and uh, using black as a way to ground a lot of my colors and a way to contrast some of the white I'm using. So I would collage together all of these different colored papers and then I would chisel out the images with the black enamel paint. <clears throat> I had a lot of uh, really magical moments making this piece because there was only my imagination that could serve it because I had no idea what it was going to really be. <clears throat> and it really made like a nice ambiance also in the studio because every day when I walked in it was like I was surrounded by these colored um, lights. <clears throat> Here's another image of studio. And then this was the final piece. Um, if you want, you can come look at my computer after. There's a better version of it on here. But um, it was exciting because the reflections on the floor really served the piece. And um, I think that it came together well in a way I didn't expect. It had a lot of different components to it that I had no idea were going to occur. Like, Depending on what type of day it would be, like um, it would give way to this like flickering three-dimensionality. Um, and it was funny because one of the girls that was working at the um, museum came up to me and she like pulled me aside and she whispered like, "Is it supposed to look 3D? <laughs> because it's like turning and it's changing when I look at it, and like it looks almost like it's coming out of the wall at one point and then it's like moving back out into the sun." So. It was kind of funny, like, the relationship it, it had with the community there, too. <clears throat> uh, the other aspect of this work had to do with me thinking about, again, the architecture of the entire space. So during the day, it was lit from the sun, as you can see here, and it had, like, a daylight type of lifespan to it. And then at night, obviously, it would turn completely black um, because there was no more sunlight. And, but from the lights inside, when you stood outside, you could see um, the entire piece uh, illuminated by the interior lights. And so I wanted to make the entire museum almost like a container. And then this was like the lid of the container. So each piece has to do with this idea of looking inside and outside of a container. <clears throat> Speaking of containers, the next work um, has to do with vessels and the storage of vessels. And my thoughts along these lines had to do with um, it's kind of not happening anymore when people give their dishes away, like their grandmother's dishes to their, to their granddaughters, or this passing down, this heritage that once happened, I feel like, in our country and abroad, where dishes were something that you received as a, as a part of your inheritance. And I feel like um, nobody really wants to receive China dishes anymore with their inheritance. And a lot of these things like are very valuable, but they're kind of shoved away or put into a storage closet. So when I was considering the idea of storage, <clears throat> I thought about the dishes I'm going to inherit <laughs> and how strange that is, because I'll probably um, never use them. But they're this thing that's been passed down for so many years. So as I've been mentioning, I've been in conversation with the white of the wall. So I wanted to use the white of the wall as a form for the dishes to occupy. So I wanted to turn the white of the wall into the dishes, essentially. And this piece had so many different iterations. It started as uh, metal cutouts, where I was building the negative space of uh, the dishes with the metal cutouts. And I was securing these nails on the back of the metal 
and then sticking them on the wall as if to assemble them. It was almost like this 2D assemblage, and it was quite weird because um, they were like floating in front of the wall, and so they had a shadow to them, and they were uh, going back and forth uh, and operating like a painting and a sculpture at the same time. And this is what I thought I was going to do. I, I was going to use these metal cutouts and then also paint on the wall. So it would be like an optical illusion where when you walked up to the piece, you would see the black flatly painted on the back wall. And then you would see some pieces coming off of the wall. And when I did it, it was really amazing because you really couldn't tell what was painted and uh, what was protruding off the wall at different points of the day and, and different times when you looked at it. So it had this uh, illusionary aspect to it that I was really attracted to. And then as time went by and I started getting more into this piece, I realized how impossible it was going to be to actually install it um, because I would just get lost in the details and the fragments of the metal pieces. <clears throat> so I decided to break down each of the dish um, works into different cabinets. And I also felt like, in a way, the dishes were starting to look like hieroglyphics or some type of text. And it was almost like they were getting too long, like when they were like up against the wall and they were like going all the way down the wall and around. I wanted to build these walls that would wrap around the viewer, almost like a scrolling dish going around you. And I felt like eventually that was too much. And so I ended up weeding it out and, and making each of these cabinets. So there were four individual cabinets. And to me, thinking about the dishes as text, also related to these cabinets as being uh, pages out of a book. And so I made these cabinets out of uh, drawings that I created in my studio. And I had this um, work fabricated in Oklahoma, which was really odd, because I had to do a lot of it on the phone and on the computer. And so uh, basically, I took my drawings, these black and white drawings, and then I transcribed them into a uh, computer rendering. And then they were given to a guy who had like a plasma cutter. And he cut each one of these like implied shelves. Um, he cut the dishes out of each one of these shelves. And then I secured them onto these white wall cabinets that I built. And <clears throat> and did everything that I wanted. And it was also like another uh, way that I worked blindly for this entire show, because I had no idea how this piece was going to turn out until literally the day of the install. So when they, they went up, I was really happy to see the shadows. Like I didn't know if the shadows were really going to be conveyed or if the white of the wall would have any dimension. <clears throat> But it, you can't really tell from here, but it really did have like um, this strange optical effect where each of the dishes were either like coming out of the wall or they were receding. And it was like this uh, figure ground relationship that was exciting to me. <clears throat> so you can see some of the shadows. It was almost like at certain times of the day, you could kind of see it as a uh, charcoal drawing or uh, even a pencil drawing because the shadows, uh, there was so mu much multiplicity in the shadows of different grays and the tonality of it was uh, really like elegant and lovely and felt delicate like a dish. But yet everything was hard and like really hard lined and chiseled out, which was also another like um, contrast to the work, materially speaking. <clears throat> so um, when I started the first project I mentioned earlier, I um, thought about how I could make the milkmaid's tapestries out of paint. And I had been doing a lot of different sewing with paint techniques that I had built over time. And I decided to kind of reinvigorate my methods by trying to consider how these tapestries could be remade out of paint. And so I thought about the relationship to the window in Vermeer paintings and how important and instrumental they always are. And I just thought of window screen, like aluminum window screen, and felt like it would be a contemporary way to sort of introduce this relationship to something that, again, like you look outside of typically, but then you're building this interior object. So it has this inside-outside component to it. So this was one of the first tapestries that I made with just white paint. And I used a template that um, I worked from my, uh, my rug, actually, from my home. 
and it's my cat's favorite rug, so I call this the Poseidon rug template. And I've had many different colors made of it and lots of different renditions of it. And I worked with just this basic template for a long time, trying to figure out how to do this technique. <clears throat> and you can see some of the close-ups. Like, it actually gives a lot of uh, believability and makes you convinced that you're sitting in front of a tapestry. And <clears throat> they're just acrylic paint, so you actually could walk on them or uh, toss them around or vacuum them uh, like you would a rug. So here's one of uh, the ones I made early on. I like this uh, pixelation that happens with the colors. Um, so each thread of the tapestries is almost like a Seurat painting. And these were three different versions of the Poseidon rug. And I started using like outdoor themes like sun, moon, and stars at this time, working with this idea of inside and outside, as I mentioned before. Uh, I had to build a lot of different contraptions to try and figure out how to actually do this. And uh, this was one of the first ones where I actually took stretcher boards and uh, started putting them up against my wall in different ways. So it's like I'm using the same uh, framework that anyone would use in a painting. It's just I'm remapping it out to serve the purpose for these different methods. Um, and they've grown over time, so now I have this larger contraption that I can actually walk behind and push the paint through. And this uh, theme of me painting blindly occurs here as well, where I'm actually standing behind the painting, and I don't really know what's happening on the other side. So it's kind of exciting to work from something from the back and the front. And I feel like that's a lot of what I'm speaking about in terms of extrapolating the material of paint in itself and taking it apart and trying to see it from as many different perceptions and work with it in all of these ways where it becomes like a physical, uh, dimensional, relationship. Um, for the show in Oklahoma, I actually made a series of tapestries that, again, related to uh, sky themes. So each one of them um, was named after sun, moon, and stars. And this was the first time I used my own uh, language in making these tapestries. I've been working with this template for so long, and so I decided to use some of my own drawings and then just basically replicate them into the tapestries. Uh, someone came to my studio and said, this is the blood of Guernica. So I put this here. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Um, that was an interesting idea. So here's a close up. You can see all of the different uh, threads of paint put together. And the kind of oddball characters that are emerging. And this was the installation. A lot of uh, my relationship to Oklahoma, I tried to bring out a lot of the stories that I grew up with. And um, mostly my biggest connection to nature growing up had to do with the sky, because it was basically the only nature I had growing up. I mean, it's the primary like way you experience nature is through the sky. So when I was growing up, I would often go out into the country and lie in a bed of grass and look at the stars and listen to music. And so a lot of my memories have to do with the sky and the emptiness of the sky. And, um, People often feel like really overwhelmed by um, the barren landscape there because it's just so empty and open. And um, I find it very much to be like home to walk into this very vacant space. Here's the moon painting. And then the last installation had to do with uh, painting on canvas. And I guess in a lot of ways what occurred to me during this project was I think overall what I'm trying to do is basically talk to uh, a lot of things like the stone breakers or a lot of paintings like the stone breakers where um, I'm elevating these common workers. So I'm rebuilding the milkmaid space 
and recontextualizing her from a servant to a queen or someone at a higher status. Um, and much like uh, Courbet, like reintroduced the painting of these common workers and tried to elevate their presence in a way that hadn't normally been seen in art. And so I'm just rebuilding her space and dimensions. And I've been using a lot of like miniature um, subjects to get reference from lately. And I got sucked into this uh, wormhole of looking at Barbie objects on eBay. And <laughs> if you ever are <laughs> looking for something to do, I highly recommend it because it is one of the strangest things I've ever seen where people make arrangements like this and they're for sale for $1.25. And I just can't imagine how long it took for them to put these things together. And they really do. And there's hundreds of pages of Barbie um, items on eBay. And so I built the formats for uh, my paintings and the cabinetry room, like the last space had to do with uh, looking into a closet or a cabinet. And I built a lot of these, uh, the formats of the canvases to reflect the ideas of uh, drawers and cabinet spaces. So much like when you open a drawer and you're looking at it from one plane, I feel like what I'm trying to do, as I've been saying, is break into this new dimensionality of painting or looking at painting. And so I wanted like the drawer to go from one plane to another. So I'm like pulling things and um, putting them on to different perspectives. Barbie shoes is a really fun thing to look through. So I made a painting of boots um, that were really similar to a lot of the Barbie shoe images I had found. And I liked the way that people arrange them. You can see the little box of high heel shoes, and they separate them, and I spend a lot of time with this stuff. So I also like wanted the wardrobe to have uh, reflective qualities of things that you would find in, in Oklahoma, like a lot of people have boots and bows. So I made a large scale painting of bows collected together. <clears throat> There's lots of bows on eBay. <clears throat> and then um, this was a very minimal painting for me, but I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it's called Yellow Trousers. And it's one of the paintings that I really tried to incorporate um, something like a family story with New York. So I wanted to kind of build a relationship between New York and Oklahoma. And when I was growing up, or when my dad was growing up when he was like eight years old, he um, was in New York with my grandfather who dressed very eccentrically. And he was wearing these, my grandfather was wearing these yellow trousers and they were walking down the street in Manhattan, and someone yelled down from the second story window, take off those yellow trousers. Take off those yellow trousers, I say. <laughs> and I don't know why that's so funny, but it just like ended up being like a really funny thing that ended up living in my family for so long. Like my dad still says it randomly when we're in the middle of conversation. He'll just say, take off those yellow trousers. Did you ever hear the story about the yellow trousers? And so <laughs> I decided, I yeah. <laughs> so I decided to, to finally put the yellow trousers into a work of art. And then, um, basically, I want to end here with a quote that I got the name of the exhibition from. It was from an Eckhart Tolle um, statement that I'll read for you here. Um, a beggar had been sitting by the side of the road for over 30 years. One day, a stranger walked by. Spare some change, mumbled the beggar, mechanically holding out his old baseball cap. I have nothing to give you, said the stranger. Then he asked. What's that you are sitting on? Nothing, replied the beggar, just an old box. I've been sitting on it for as long as I can remember. Ever looked inside, asked the stranger. No, said the beggar, what's the point? There's nothing in there. Have a look inside, insisted the stranger. The beggar managed to pry the lid open. With astonishment, disbelief, and elation, he saw that the box was filled with gold. I am that stranger who has nothing to give you and who is telling you to look inside. Not inside any box, as in the parable, but some 
where even closer inside yourself.